For those less familiar, and I would be in that group, that was Chopin, Prelude E, Prelude in E minor, Opus 28, number four, that we began with. I want to say good afternoon to you. My name is Scott Smith, one of the pastors here at Emmanuel Faith. And on behalf of the family, I certainly want to say thank you for taking some time out this afternoon to come and, and join us as we gather together to honor Sylvia. That's our goal this afternoon. We're going to honor her. And we're going to also honor God. Psalm 139, 13 and 14 says this. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. And I would stand before you this afternoon and ask you a question. Is there any doubt in your mind that Sylvia was wonderfully made? Of course not. Of course not. God made her. He thought about her and how she would be and who she would be. And he planned it all out, didn't he? And then he brought her not only into his world, but into yours. And she became for you a tremendous blessing. So her giftings and her abilities and her passions, all of them are a gift from God. Her friendship, the difference that she made, the real difference that she made in your life, a gift, a gift from heaven. Without God, there's no Sylvia. So that's why we gather in his presence to remember and honor her and then also to honor the God who made her. Before we get started with all this, I want to take a minute and I'm going to pray. The reason I'm going to do that is because God is here. He is here. And where he is, there is hope and there is encouragement, there's comfort, there's strength. And we're going to take a minute, we're going to ask him to do what he very much wants to do. Engage with us as we go through this time. I recognize as you're here, you might not be a person who prays, so I want to respect that. So before I pray, we're going to take a moment of silence in honor of Sylvia. And you do with that as you wish. And I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go on into our service together, okay? All right. A moment of silence in honor of Sylvia Bresnik. Our Father in heaven, we, we recognize your presence with us this afternoon. We welcome it. We ask for your help. I ask for your spirit to do his good work in our lives this afternoon. Lots of emotions all over the map from one end to the other. And you know it all. And you know every heart. And you're able to minister in ways that only you can. So we ask you to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Psalm 46 is one of Sylvia's favorite chapters in the Bible. So I'm going to read it to you in its entirety. It is only 10 verses, 11, 10 verses, 11. We're going to read 10 of them. And then it perfectly sets up the hymn that we are going to sing together when I'm done. So Psalm 46, for the director of music of the sons of Korah, according to Alamothoth a song. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So come and see what the Lord has done. 
The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's sing together as we sing of God's faithfulness both in life and in death. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. Psalm 3.3. That was the verse that my mom made me memorize and has become the rudder of my life. For some find it easy to be kind. 
and some find it easy to be truthful. But to combine the two is a bit of a trick. We just want to thank you for being here. It means so much to us. Some of you have come from a long way away. Her sisters, her nieces, her nephew, all the way from San Francisco. Some of you can't be here today and are watching on video. And the support we've got over the last two weeks has been overwhelming. I'm so, so grateful. My mom lived for you. My mom loved people, especially little ones. As my friend Peggy said, Sylvia made you feel special. When you were with Sylvia, it was as if that was the only moment that mattered. My mom was my best friend. She was all you needed. She ran with you, hiked with you. She swam and biked with you. She could rest with you and shop with you, drink bellinis and watch movies with you. My mom was a woman of great understanding. She had known pain, but she chose to resiliently focus on what was good. As our friend Carol said, Sylvia had great perspective. Her wisdom was that timely, perfect sentiment that kept you going. My mom preferred to be having fun, so when she needed to be serious, I think she tried to be as efficient as possible. She gave her advice out in succinct one-liners, so you better be listening. Her parenting advice was have few no's, but let them be no. Her life advice was remember, you become what you focus on. So I've tried to make good choices. When I was ruminating, she would toss out, a good soldier never looks behind, which would annoy me. But she was right. Why waste energy on the past? It's gone. When I was worried about something, she gently reminded me, all we have is now. Enjoy the moment. My mom was passionate about many things, sports, family, friends, fun. As her friends Brenda and Patrick both pointed out, my mom always pushed the limits but she wasn't above drafting you for advantage. My mom had amazing resilience, amazing strength. She rested by swimming three times a week with Christy. She inspired me and so many others to be courageous, to become the best version of yourself. As my cousin Sandra and our friends Karen and Phyllis reminded me, Sylvia didn't take life too seriously. She loved to laugh, play, eat and drink, and enjoy the time she had. She had nicknames for everyone in her family. Angie Pangy, Father John, Roberto, Polly Lal, Johnny Pond, Eli, Jules, Nicolioli, Bingy, Skyly Lyle, Tata, Studlebug. She could be silly. My mom lived a great life. How she got through it, we'll never know. Her infamous sense of direction means she was always getting turned around. She once accidentally wandered into Japan <laughs> on her way to Vietnam for my brother's wedding. She then had to stay the night because immigration was closed. It took her 16 hours to get back into the airport. And we were very lucky to see her again. She was often lost. Sometimes in the forest, sometimes at a garage sale. As her friends Lizzie and Brian said, my mom always gave her all. Whether that meant trying a new yoga class or testing a new wine, my mom was alive. My mom was alive until the moment she wasn't. And that's her legacy. A lesser life would not have suited her. And so a part of me is comforted that she died on Easter Sunday, going down Champagne Boulevard, doing what she loved. I found a little card, lest you think this 
newfound appreciation is um, due to her passing. I wrote this 15 years ago to my mom, and I think it sums it up. To the best mother, friend, and person there ever was, I love you. Pauline. What we'd like to do now is we've carved some space out in the service for you, if you would like to, handful perhaps, to share some memories, some stories of Sylvia. Um, so I've got the microphone and I will move around, <clears throat> excuse me, to where you are if you'd like to share and I already see a person here. Hi, um, I'm Sandra. Lucky for you all that I have very short space in between crying, otherwise I'd stand here for days and talk about her. I was very, very, very proud of myself to walk two miles over a few hills until Sylvie decided she was climbing Mount Whitney because, well, why wouldn't anybody want to climb Mount Whitney? So I was dragged all over San Diego, up and down, in and out. So I became a hiker. But I've, I've always liked the outdoors, and I would stop her and point out a bird here, and, a, and oh, look, and there's a coyote, and so forth. And this went on for years. Uh, most recently, we were doing the Mule Hill Trail there. It's on the east side of Hodges. It's flat. She was, she'd hurt her glute, and she wanted me to come along because I kind of slowed her down, which meant that she'd only do three miles instead of the six, and then have to sit on ice for the rest of the week. So we were out there Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And I'd be, we had all that rain there. We had a flood after the deluge. And it meant all the, the waders came up, all the, the birds that weighed came up real close to the trail. And we'd be looking at them. And so one day she turned to me and said, now tell me again which birds I know. So. So I mentioned a few. And then another day, I think it was, it was the last or second last time we did Mule Hill, she says, there's an egret. And she said, Sylvia Bresnik recognized a bird. <laughs> and that's, that's Sylvia, she, she just kept doing. She, uh, her, her, she, she was interested in everything. She was, her life was like a child in a toy shop. Everything was so exciting. She kept progressing. Her personality was a bull in a china shop. Very funny bull. <laughs> it was great. Her faith kept her, kept her through the ups and downs. And I know, I know as sure as the reality is that I'm standing here, that we're all here, I know the reality is on Easter Sunday, a few hours after she was tearing down a hill, she heard, well done, good and faithful servant. Good afternoon, my name is Randy Bresnick, and uh, my brother Ed and I and our wives would often come down from the Los Angeles area to visit John. Sometimes we got Sylvia. She was usually on a trip somewhere. But we were very blessed and very fortunate to be able to have lunch with them and talk with them in the middle of March on a Sunday. And on Wednesday, she went to England to be with Pauline and family. And then we got this, the uh, information. But every time we talked to Sylvia and John, she was animated. She talked all the time. She shared her stories. What a wonderful lady. We were blessed to have her in the family. So Sylvia, we're going to miss you. And we're going to be there in support of you, John. So early one morning, about 16 years ago, Brad and I were rolling out on the bike heading north on 395. And on the corner of Grand and um, Midway, we're stopped at a stoplight, and there's this woman sitting there on a bicycle. 
It was Sylvia, and that's when I first met her. And she was coming off an injury. She hadn't ridden in a couple of months. And she got out there and she rode all up and down those hills. I was totally blown away. <sighs> and uh, I've been riding with her ever since. Um, Sylvia loved to ride on my back wheel. Pauline mentioned that uh, a thing called drafting. And when you're drafting off of somebody on a bicycle, you can save anywhere from 5 to 30% of your energy. And so Sylvia was a totally unrepentant wheel sucker. She'd get back up and she'd never get off. When you ride as many thousands of miles as Sylvia and I had, you get to know that person pretty well. And I found that uh, what I learned about her is that she loved her, her family, her husband, her kids, her grandkids, her grandniece. She loved her Lord. And she was pretty fond of red wine. I like to think now that, um, well, I do have a story about her, OK? Um, the people that we ordinarily rode with on Sunday, uh, only Sylvie and I were there. I don't know what happened to the other folks, but we're out riding, and as we're riding, we're going about 50 miles, and it's getting hotter and windier. And we're riding back into Escondido, we're coming down Mission, and Sylvia's riding my back wheel, right where she's supposed to be, and we turned on the Center City Parkway, and this wind, this headwind, just bam! I'm like, oh my gosh. So in cycling, if you want the person behind you to come up and take a pull on the front and break through the wind, you flick your elbow like this. And so I flicked my elbow, no Sylvia. I flicked my elbow a second time, and I heard this little Sylvia voice behind me going, not bloody likely. <laughs> now, there's no mention of Jesus being a cyclist in scripture. But I suspect he is a cyclist because cyclists are cool and Jesus is cool, all right? And I think right now, or maybe not right now, but sometime soon, she's going to be out riding with her Lord on that brand new red bike of hers with the disc brakes. And Jesus better be careful on those climbs, those heavenly climbs, those heavenly hills, because if he, if he backs off just one second, she's going to drop him like a club rider, okay? I can see Sylvia, after a long ride with Jesus, sitting around, and I can see her say, you know, Lord, remember that little thing you did at the marriage in Cana where you turned the water into wine? The water in this water bottle here, do you think maybe you could uh, turn it into a 2002 Cabernet Sauvignon? Okay. Anyhow, I just wanted to say that I'm going to miss her, as we all miss her, and um, thank you. Um, my name is Liam Do. Um, I'm a friend of Patrick, Ron, and uh, Sylvia. I've um, only known Sylvia for about uh, four years since I uh, started cycling with Patrick and Sylvia. Um, um, I've learned so much from Sylvia. Um, uh, she, she say many sweet little things like, the best saddle is time in the saddle because I was looking for a saddle to, to, to fit. Um, so it's, you know, so little things like that, you know, the, the best saddle is time in the saddle. And I'm like, yeah, sure, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Sylvia's, you know, when I, when I found out how old she was, I'm like, wow, I, I, I can't believe this lady still can ride 100 miles at a time. Um, and, and, and when Patrick and Ron and I and Sylvia, we, we, we uh, uh, did the Sylvain Century ride together, um, it, it, it's, um, th there was a stretch toward the end as we were coming into town. Um, I guess the first time I've done that ride, um, and being a, a young rookie, I, I spent way too much energy toward the, toward, toward the end. And so we were on the last hill heading into town, and, and my legs are, are giving out. I'm cramping up, and, and Sylvia just take off. And I'm like, oh my God, he's a 73-year-old lady just leaving me in the dust. <laughs> and, and how am I going to explain this? Um, 
So uh, I, I'm going to truly miss Sylvia. Um, I, I, I want to be like Sylvia when I grow up. Um, so that's just a, a little, a, a little uh, for me. I met Sylvia just about 23 years ago through Sandra. And we used to go hiking and walking together. And everything they've talked about is true. I couldn't keep up with her. But one of the times we went out in the bushes to do what you do when you hike and you run and there's no place to go, Sylvie commented, she said, oh my goodness, your underwear matches your clothes. And just last month when we went hiking on Mule Hill, she reminded me and she asked me, does your underwear still match your clothes? And yes, it did. But today I'm not gonna tell you whether or not it does. <laughs> But Sylvie knows. She will be missed. Six years ago, I was uh, hiking Mount Woodson. And I'm about a mile, mile and a half on this trail. And the lo and behold, I see these two ladies approaching me, Sandra and Sylvia. And they have these huge, heavy packs on. So they, they come up to me and they say, which way to Mount Whitson? I says, you need to turn around and go back the other way, since, you know, the direction thing she has. And so I go past them and I get all the way up to Mount Whitson and about 15, 20 minutes later, both of them arrive and I'm going, okay. They come up to me and we're exchanging information because I'm saying, you must be working uh, for a big, big hike. And she says, yeah, I'm going up Mount Whitney. He says, awesome, I am too. But she was going sooner than I was, and so I said, great, good luck on that, and um, let's ex exchange more information just in case you need more stuff that you need or more information about how to do this hike. Hey, I'm your man. So fortunately, unfortunately or fortunately, on that first hike up Mount Whitney, it, it didn't go as, as well as they planned. So consequently, we got back together again and had this conversation. I said, you know what? I just might have some extra permits when I go up. And, and yes, I did have some extra permits. So we went up Whitney and this lady was just awesome. Um, in fact, she was so awesome that I think she didn't realize she really did it. So she had to do it another time a, a year later. So this lady was just awesome, John. So I'm going to go you, you, and then I can't, okay, you were pointed out to me, so I'm going to go you, you, you. I've, here's the thing, there will be a time afterward at the reception, there's memory cards and you can talk more. I, I wish we could go on as long as everyone would want to share, but I've got to, I'm sorry, but I got to. Well, there are two things that, um, three things that um, I want to point out about Sylvia that every, everybody sitting here already knows. Sylvia Bresnick could not sneak up on anybody. You always heard her, heard her laughter, heard her chatter, wherever you were. She was, she was there two minutes before you actually saw her because of her, her laughter coming first. We'll never forget that laugh. Um, the other thing is that everybody in the world knew Sylvie Bresnick. It was so common and yet so, um, I don't know what the word is, so, so startling to be someplace in the middle of, of nowhere, far away from friends, from family, from wherever, and somebody goes, Sylvie, Sylvie Bresnick, is that you? She knew everybody. <laughs> everybody knew Sylvia Bresnick. Um, and the third thing is, that Sylvia Bresnick was a life force. She was just a, a force of, an, of energy, of life, of everything. And I think that's why it's so hard for us, I think all of us here, to grasp. Because Sylvia not being alive kind of doesn't work. And so I'm certain that Sylvie's alive. Because Sylvie is life. Anyway, that's all.
<laughs> well, <laughs> I moved here in 1990 and God placed me in Sylvia's <clears throat> uh, BSF class. And she had the most social BSF class I think that ever existed. We had so much fun and she was such a joy. And that year, I remember her saying that she was swimming in La Jolla and she ran, but somebody said, if I give you a bicycle, will you do triathlons? So that was, the, I think, the beginning of her triathlons in 1990, and, um, or when she started riding her bike. So um, we'll all remember her, as everybody has said today, <laughs> with such joy. I was telling the family a minute ago, I've done these before, and you go to this open sharing, and there's one person, two, and it's very kind of surfacey stuff. It's nothing like this. This is an honor to Sylvia. Okay. Um, my name is Brian, and my wife Liz. Um, we got to know uh, Sylvia first through Liz partnering with her in bike riding and running, as many of you probably had the same experience. We were fortunate enough to uh, get to know Sylvia very well, and she essentially became a member of our family over time. We'd have John and Sylvia over for um, dinner, and one of John's favorite, one of 67 Hopalong Cassidy episodes, and um, Sylvia would invariably fall asleep on the couch. And, but um, uh, as time went on, uh, we'd have Sylvia over for a lot of things that we enjoy doing, such as wine tasting, Temecula, going to our field for a glass of wine. And when she'd come over, we would just leave the front door open. And when she'd come to our house, she'd just walk in the front door and you'd hear her, hola, hola. And we knew Sylvia was here. And so um, we, uh, as I think some of the other people have also said, uh, Sylvia had this uh, interest in hiking Mount Whitney um, I actually got permits for Sylvia, myself, and, and my wife to go up Mount Whitney, but unfortunately the day before there was a monsoonal rain and washed away the, the, um, the um, trail and they had to life flight people off the mountain, but uh, we went ultimately with John Adler and a group of um, others who I'm glad to see are here to celebrate her life. And um, we, uh, she motivated me to get to the top of 14,505 feet because I was not going to have a 70 plus year old woman get there and I did not get there. And I, you know, I couldn't handle that one. But um, when, uh, when we all got back to the base camp at about 11,000 feet uh, at about 10 p.m., uh, Sylvia, for some reason, asked me if I'd cook her a, a cup of chicken noodle soup. And I thought, oh, that's kind of odd, but I guess she's hungry after that long trek. So I did. I found a cup of noodles or something. And so I made the soup, and um, the next morning she, she disclosed to me that because of the altitude and the strain of the hike, she was kind of delusional, and she thought she had arrived home from school in Ireland, and she would ask her mother to make her a cup of chicken noodle soup. <laughs> and I didn't know how to take that because I was her mother. <laughs> so. Um, that was uh, one of the anecdotes that we all laughed about all the way back from uh, Mount Whitney to San Diego. Um, and it seemed like every time we would go out with Sylvia, we'd always have an anecdote to tell about Sylvia. And um, the one frequent one was when uh, we last um, went to uh, see the play A Christmas Carol up in Orange County, and that was gonna be our tradition every year. And the year before we had gone, and um, we noticed everybody was wearing a red scarf. So we found out that in the play, that Scrooge had, had a red scarf at the end of the play, so everybody in the audience would bring a red scarf. So the next year, this past Christmas time, we all, we all decided we were gonna have a red scarf. So uh, Liz knitted Sylvia a red scarf, and then hadn't completed my red scarf, but it was, you know, maybe a foot short. And so Sylvia said, well, give it to me. I'm, and she's in the back seat and she's knitting my scarf as we're driving up the 405 freeway. And she literally knitted the last little knit or whatever you call it and, and cut it off. And uh, I had my red scarf, so I'm very thankful for her. Um, I'm uh, also take 
a lot of comfort in knowing that uh, Sylvia really was a true believer and uh, she knew her Lord. Um, and uh, I just uh, have a lot of comfort in knowing that when she got to heaven, that those gates were probably open already. And she said, hola, and everybody in heaven knew she was home. So I just am very blessed to know that. All right, now we're going to have uh, John's going to come and share some of his thoughts, and then you can tell him what you're going to do. Yeah. 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 I'm going to take these stairs over here. I, uh, I'm, I uh, met Sylvia. Well, let me see now. She left Ireland when she was 21, and she went to Germany. She had a two-year contract with Siemens Electric up in Heidenheim. So in the meantime, I was in the Army. I was in a band, I played the piano, and I played uh, the cymbals in the marching band. So I, would, I was uh, already there. She finished her two-year contract, and then moved, came, she and two girlfriends moved down to Augsburg. That's where, we, where, I, where I was, Augsburg. And then she got a job uh, in the snack bar on the base where I was. So I'm on, I'm on leave. I, go out, I went on leave to uh, Copenhagen and I, for 10 days. So I played, I played some, did some playing up there. I got back from Copenhagen and then went to my room and then went right, you have to go right to go to the snack bar and get a cup of coffee. So I walked in the snack bar and I saw this <laughs> fantastic lady. Uh, I've never, I've never seen anybody that attracted, that attracted before. Hey, Paul, you get any water? Hey. Uh, and that was August of '63. Thanks. Yeah, you're thirsty. So we didn't. Uh, I just, I just went in there. August of 63, I saw her in the snack bar, and I, we, hadn't, we didn't go on our first date till uh, January of 60, 64, right? So, meantime, I go in there and see her every day, and she makes milkshakes, and we just kind of get to know each other a little bit. But I, I didn't ask her on a date. I didn't think I was good enough, because she was so attractive, and we, she had her choice from all these guys. I mean, on, on an army base, she got thousands of guys. So I didn't ask her out till uh, in December sometime. In the meantime, we were in the snack bar, and this is probably in the fall, and I, my buddy Roger Hawk, who's a trombone player, were sitting at this table, and I, I pointed at Sylvia. He said, see that girl? <clears throat> I'm gonna marry her. So uh, we went, started going out in 64, and uh, went sitting in June of 65, we got married. I'm back in the, in the Palisades. I was living in the Palisades up in the LA area. And uh, that was the beginning. June of 65, we got married on June the 12th, 1965. And Pauline was born on March the 12th, 1966. So we didn't waste any time. <laughs> and then we just kept having, kept having kids, you know? I mean, that's, that's what you do. And finally, we got, we got well, we decided, I decided to move to Escondido. I had a, a good buddy, um, Steve Scott, well, Gene's here. Steve Scott was a, a painter, uh, and it was a very successful painter. He was in a couple of galleries, and, and I wanted to learn how to paint, because in those days, if you moved to Ireland, uh, you didn't, and artists didn't pay any, in, any taxes, any income tax. So I wanted to, that sounded good to me, so I wanted to, <laughs> Get out of taxes. I got so I learned. I didn't. I did start. I went. I moved us. Well, that's not the only reason. The other reason was Manuel Faith. Manuel Faith had a reputation in West <clears throat> in West LA as being like the neatest church to go to for, for if you're saved, if you're born again Christian. Manuel Faith. So one of the, one of the reasons I came, came here was for Manuel Faith. The other one was this work with Steve. So I went up. In the meantime, we had the four kids. We got here. Oh yeah. Before we came here. Well, she's expecting Steve. We got another one on the way. Shall we move? Well, yeah, I guess so. So we moved, and Steve was born here 
in uh, 70, well, we came here in 77. And he was born here in 77. And then, anyway, I, know, I forgot where I am now. Anyway, uh, yeah, we just, oh yeah, I got to, I got to Steve, Steve Scott was teaching teach me. I decided I didn't really like art. I didn't like, want to be a painter. And so I went back to the sign business because I was raised in the sign business. So uh, I went back in the sign business and I, that's what I've been doing ever since. I'm still in the sign business. <clears throat> Steve, I'm, Steve's really in the sign business. I'm helping him now. <clears throat> um, let's see, and then I played, oh yeah, well, it's just, that's a problem. You know, yeah, I can go on for the next, you can imagine, telling stories. So anyway, that was a shock. I mean, this wasn't supposed to happen. I'm the guy that had bypass surgery uh, several years ago. I've had three heart attacks. I'm, not, I'm supposed to go first, but it didn't work out that way. So I have to, uh, but I'm sure you're glad she's up She's with Jesus because she's kind of made it. Yeah. Well, let me play a song. She really liked this song. And, uh, I'll you see what I can do here. It takes a couple minutes, nothing. Okay. mention that uh, I started playing, I started, uh, I took three years of classical, and by the way, I've listened to that prelude many times that Betty played, but she doesn't as good as anybody I've heard. <clears throat> Amazing. Anyway, I started, I took classical for three years, and then everybody was, you know, you have to play jazz. Okay, yeah, I like, I like jazz. So I took jazz lessons from a guy in Hollywood for, for one year. At the end of the year, I was working. I was playing jobs and dances and partying and whatever. So I started playing professionally. Well, I did not full time, but I got paid to play when I was 15. And then when we got, just before we got married in like the late, late 64, I said, this is, this is not gonna work. I'm not gonna, I can't do this and be married and have kids and all that. So I quit the music business. But I had nine years in the music business. And I, I've been playing ever since, but I haven't done any work, I haven't worked at it, so. I, and plus, my fingers are getting kind of stiff. I'm 77 now, and my fingers don't work as well. But, but anyway, I'll give it a try.
Let's sing the first verse of that tune together in honor of Sylvia and her friend Jesus. I kind of want to finish up the service with bringing a little uh, kind of, sort of a, somewhat of a, of a biblical perspective and some things I'd like to share that I think would be hopeful. Um, whenever I approach these kinds of times, I put myself in your shoes and I think, what would be helpful for me? What would be hopeful for me? As we, as we met as a family and I met with the family, we planned out this memorial service. It came, it came to the light that she had three, she loved the whole Bible. But there were three verses that seemed to really mean a lot to her. One was the Proverbs 3.3. 3. Uh, one is Jeremiah 29.11. The third one is on your worship, is on your worship, is on your uh, memorial folder. And it's the Philippians 1.6 verse. And it says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Well, there's a lot of rich theology in those 25 words that we could spend a lot of time thinking about, but as I read them, one word kind of hit me, and it was the word faithfulness. Faithfulness. And maybe that's one reason why Sylvia liked it so much. The verse gave her a promise that God would be faithful to finish what he started in her life. He wasn't going to come into her life and, and, and save her and, and walk her 25, 30 years in and say, okay, well, I'm done. Good luck. Hope you make it the rest of the way on your own. She knew that the God who had saved her, she could trust him to finish the work that he began. And it's this idea of God's faithfulness in, begin, in, start, in finishing what he begins that I would like to leave you with this afternoon. Because by no fault of your own and caught completely off guard, Surprised? Sylvia's gone home. Good news for her, tough news for you. And where do you go in times like this? Where do you go for comfort? Where do you go for strength? Where do you go for encouragement? Well, you go to God. You go to God. And as you go to him, I think Philippians 1.6 provides a source of assurance that God can be the encouragement and everything that you need. Because it reminds you, it reminds me, it reminds us that in our grief and in our pain and our confusion and in our anger, perhaps with all of our questions, all of our whys and what ifs and if onlys, that we, that you can still approach God with all the confidence in the world that he will continue to be at work in your life, helping you and walking with you through this period of grief. Just as he has been faithful to you in the past, and you could tell stories, could you not, of his faithfulness to you in the past, he will be faithful to you today, and as you move into a future that is not what you were thinking it was going to be, 
with some uncertainties, he will be faithful to you then as well. We sang abide with me, right? And it, it, as you would cry out to God, abide with me, God, because my heart is broken with pain, his response is gonna be, of course. I will be for here for you today, just like I was yesterday, and I will be here for you in the future. And I know you believe that. And so that makes all the difference in the world. Deuteronomy 31.8. The Lord himself goes before you, and he will be with you. He will never fail you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Why? Because he is faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. The good news, that, the hopeful news, is that he will continue to be faithful to you and he will continue to work in your life even in this dark time of grief. He, and I, I'm not trying to make light of this, but he and only he can bring purpose to this, bring purpose to the pain. So you think about the future, you think about what's out in front and I would ask you, how do you need to experience God's faithfulness? What do you need from him? Mark 10, 46 to 52 records a rather amazing interaction that Jesus has with a blind man. Jesus is coming into town and this blind man hears that he's coming and he starts yelling for Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, please. Jesus hears that he's yelling, calls the guy over, says, Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus says, I wanna see. And Jesus says, your faith has healed you. I would ask you that Jesus that talked to Bartimaeus is here talking to you. You have the freedom to ask him what you need. He said, what do you need me to do for you as I help you walk through this time? What do you need me to do? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God. In per and he says, ask, ask. I will be faithful to you. He will be faithful to complete the work he began. Part of that work now is walking you through this journey. And you can count on him. You can count on him. And you can count on the fact that he will provide resources to you. In the, in, in, by giving you people. Part of his plan is that you not walk through this alone. And of course you have him, and in him you have all that you need, but he has also said, I, you need other people. You need people to go through this journey of grief. So if it might be your tendency and it would be mine, uh, to hibernate, to disengage, to back away from people, I want to encourage you to do just the opposite. I want to encourage you to see these people and the people who aren't here but who love you as part of, his, as part of a faithful and loving God's provision to help you in this really, really tough time. People are a gift. The people in this room are a gift. And as you turn to God and as you let him use people in your life, eventually you will, you'll move through this. It's not easy. No one should ever lie to you and tell you that it is. Here's the tendency, here's the temptation though, is to ask yourself, when will things get back to the way they used to be? And you know they never will. 
And that's hard. You have a new normal now. Yeah, without, without your wife, without mom, people listening, without grandma. And you have a Sylvia-sized hole in your heart. And you know what? Emmanuel Faith has a Sylvia-sized hole in our heart, too. And you may walk with a limp for the rest of your life, but you'll walk again because of God, because of the people he provides you, and because he will be faithful to help you move through this time. And you can be confident of that. One last thing before we finish. A number of times as we talked and as people shared about Sylvia, um, testimony was given to the fact that she was a Christian, which meant that she believed that she was a person who had failed to live up to God's perfect standards. She understood what the Bible taught, that God sent Jesus to live a perfect life, to meet all of God's standards, and then to die, to pay the punishment that Sylvia deserved for not being able to keep those standards. And then he rose again to conquer death. And if she puts her trust in what Jesus, who he is and what he says he's done, then what he did can be applied to her by faith. And she did, she believed that, her sins were forgiven, she began to live eternal life on that day when she received Christ, and it seems like she was taking full advantage of that gift of eternal life that she had. But as you think about, as you sit here this afternoon, I want to ask you this. If you don't know Jesus, I want to submit this question. Why did you know Sylvia? Of all of the people that you could have known, why Sylvia? Acts 17 says this, from one man, God made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. So he determined that you would live now and who you would know and where you would work and where you would go to school and who you'd ride a bike with. God did this. Why did God do this? So that all the nations could, so that they would seek God and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. If I remember this right, when I was a, a younger dad and I had younger kids, my kids would always want to play hide and seek with me. Your kids ever want to play hide and seek with you? And they always wanted to be the seeker and they wanted you to be the hider. Dad, you go hide and I'm gonna come and find you. So I would go and I would hide. And I would always go and I would hide behind the curtains. But I would always hide behind the curtains with my foot sticking out. And why would that be? So that as they came around the corner into the family room, they could find me. I submit to you that Sylvia was God's foot sticking out from behind the curtains so that you could know him and what he's like and find him. Because like me, I wanted my kids to find me. And he wants you to find him. But you got to look. You got to look. And so I don't know where you are with God this afternoon, if it's time to make a move toward him for the first time, if it's time to, to return to him after some period of maybe being estranged, but I can tell you this, that no matter where you are in your relationship with God, me too, he would like to be closer to you than he currently is. He would like you to be closer to him than you currently are. John 3, 16 and 17, this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. And I want to stand before you this afternoon and say, if you have ever felt judged by a Christian, I'm sorry. Because that is not the vibe that we are supposed to give off. Jesus did not come into the world to judge the world. A day of judgment's coming. It's not now. He came to save the world. 
we can be a judgmental group and we get it wrong when we are. But Jesus loves you and he came and he died for you so that you could have a relationship with him. And if you'd like to learn more about that, talk more about that, I'm here afterward. We're here, we got a service tonight, 5.30. We got like eight tomorrow. Plenty of opportunities to come and be a part of a community of people trying to figure out how to respond to the love of God in their lives. We're gonna sing a great hymn, an Easter hymn right now. And the reason we're going to is because Easter is our great hope that we will see Sylvia again. So we look forward to that day of seeing her again by looking back on what happened on that resurrection morning so many years ago. So John Ephantides is going to lead us in Christ the Lord is risen today. Let's stand together. As in life, so in death, it's who you know that matters most. And it, isn't it fitting that the day after the church was celebrating Christ's resurrection, Sylvia was welcomed home into her eternal rest. This song speaks of the hope that we have that we will be reunited as friends in Jesus. And Sylvia's greatest hope would be that you would be one of the friends that would be reunited with her. So let's sing together as we sing of the hope that we have in Christ and his resurrection and that we will one day follow. Christ the Lord is risen today. Before we dismiss and while you're standing, there's one other thing I want to do. I watch a lot of, uh, of uh, English Premier League soccer. I won't tell you who I like because some will like me and some won't. But end of a game, maybe it's the 85th, 86th minute, and one of the guys has had a really good game and it's time to sub him out. Manager will call his number, sends a sub in. That guy comes running off the field and the manager will greet him at the sideline, right, shake his hand, pat him on the back. And all of the fans who are sitting in that stand right around there, because he's done such a good job, they will stand 
and give him an ovation because he's done such a great job. But while we're standing, I think it just makes sense to give Sylvia an ovation for such, for doing such a good job and for a life well lived. So let's give her an ovation. I want to thank you all for coming this afternoon, and I want to let you know that there are these memory sheets that I mentioned earlier, which are, going to, which are in the middle of your program, and you can leave them at a designated basket in the foyer or out at the cafe where we are going to have our reception. Uh, we're going to ask that you let the family go first. They can make their way over there. Then you can join them, and they're going to be exiting to Beethoven's Ode to Joy. So thank you for being here this afternoon.